Good evening, Evangel. Welcome to With Eyes of Faith. We're looking tonight at the life of Jephthah. Let's pray together and then we'll get into the scriptures. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us this revelation. Your word that keeps pointing to you. And I pray tonight that we would see you once again, high and lifted up. Lord, we magnify you today. Open our ears, open our eyes, and our understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. We are still here. We're coming into Jephthah's account tonight. We're going to read this again as we would see how God is uh, working in his life, working this faith in him, seeing that Jesus, once again, is the foundation. So Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. What more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. And again, we are seeing here in verse 33 and 34, those who subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong. They became valiant in battle and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And they did all of this by faith, as we see here, the very beginning of verse 33. Who through faith did these things? It cannot be overstated that this faith is through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, where it speaks about having this great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us as we've been looking at these individuals and these groups of people that have gone on before in faith. So seeing we are surrounded by these uh, witnesses, let's lay aside every weight, every hindrance that would bog us down and easily uh, uh, sidetrack us and, and remove us from the path and run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Every person that is recorded in this chapter, chapter 11, by faith, it's all faith that's been given by Jesus himself. He's the foundation for it. Every aspect every step of the way. And that's the way it is in your life and in mine. There's nobody, nobody who's put faith in Jesus Christ, who's lived a life of faith that is greater or more impressive than another. Each one has been putting faith in an awesome, extraordinary God. And he has seen us through. A uh, question for you. Who is your favorite judge that we've been looking at so far and perhaps that we've not yet looked at? Who's your favorite judge? How many has Jephthah as your favorite judge? If so, why? If no, why not? Do you know anything about him? Do you know much about Jephthah? What you know about him, does he impress you? Does he... Uh, give you this idea that, uh, I don't know about this guy. See, every person that we've looked at so far has had flaws, have had uh, situations that have been marks against them. But God does not discredit us based upon what the world looks at, or even because of our shortcomings, our failures, our sin. Jephthah might be one of these guys who is misunderstood the most, his story that is, particularly because of the vow that he takes, that he makes when he goes into battle against the Ammonites. And he, uh, it seems to be a rash vow at first glimpse, but we're going to look tonight and see that this vow is something that God endorses and again is a picture of Jesus Christ. So out of weakness, they're made strong, and they became valiant in battle. They overturned 
the power of their enemies, these strangers. So let's go back to Judges chapter 11. That's where the story of Jephthah begins for us. So Judges chapter 11, we see here in verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot, a prostitute, and Gilead begot Jephthah. This is where the first mention of Jephthah is given, but we need to go back a few verses into the latter part of chapter 10 in order for us to get an appreciation of what Jephthah is being brought into, the circumstance. So come back with me. This is after Gideon, chapter 10 and verse 6. There have been two more judges that have been raised up by God and uh, since Gideon. Uh, we have Tola and Jair. Uh, short little accounts of them, two verses for Tola, three verses for Jair. Uh, but we're coming and putting our focus on Jephthah because that's who the writer of uh, Hebrews 11 brings our focus to. But look at the situation. It's this cycle that keeps on going over and over again. Sin, repent, come back to God, victory, restoration, and then the judge dies, sin, and then repent or sin and um, with opposition from their enemies, then calling out to God and repentance, a judge is raised up and they follow, return back to God uh, until that judge dies. And then eventually they will return to their sin again. Judges 10 verse 6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was, was severely distressed. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and have served the Baals. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon? And from the Philistines, also the Sidonians and the Amalekites, the Maonites, that oppressed you. And you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand. Yet you have forsaken me, and have served other gods. Therefore I will deliver you no more. Cry out to those gods whom you have been serving, which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. Well, let's look at this. Uh, for a couple of minutes here. When it says the uh, Maonites in verse 12, it's speaking about the people of Midian. Jephthah lives in this region of Gilead. It's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Here it is. So Mizpah of Gilead is located in the northern part of, or northern uh, part of this particular map. We see it circled in red. Then compare that to the Mizpah that was in the region where Deborah, the, the uh, judge Deborah, had been located. She was in Bethel uh, between there and Ramah. She also ministered in Ramah. Mizpah is located between the two of them in this location. The Ammonites have been coming in, threatening Gilead. Then they are crossing the Jordan Rift Valley, the Jordan River, into the western bank. That when you hear about the western bank in the news, that's what it's talking about, the west bank, the west of the Jordan River in this hill country that, that's mentioned on your map, Samaria. That's the west bank that is belonging to Jordan today. 
but in the West Bank, if you look at the hill country, uh, that's the region that the Ammonites have been coming into, Ephraim, and then the Mizpah that's uh, located there, the smaller Mizpah, uh, at least in the print and the, uh, the thinner red circle. That's Benjamin. So they've been coming into those two tribes. One other thing I want you to look at here, just beside where it says hill country, in the middle of your map, is Shiloh. That's the location of the tabernacle at this point in time. And that's going to come into play when we look at Jephthah's vow and his daughter. And I, just an idea of the lay of the land so that we're not uh, just going about this blind and trying to picture what this might look like. So uh, that will help you get a little bit of a picture of what's going on. Notice that the Lord speaks about seven nations. Verse 11, the Lord said to the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from, and then he names off seven nations. It's indicating uh, a number of completion. It's like they've, they've gone completely after these other uh, nations, after these other gods, one after the other, and sometimes uh, some in succession or at the same time as the others. It's like they keep coming back to them, keep coming back to them. And they have taken up these gods for themselves. Well, the Lord says, uh, go ahead and call on these gods. Notice in verse 10 that they said, we have sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and we have served the Baals. The Baals are, uh, means lords or masters, the masters of the land as far as the other nations are concerned. But they didn't reject those balls. They just acknowledged that they had sinned, that they had forsaken God. And God said, well, I'm, I'm not going to respond to you. I'm not going to hear you any longer. You've forsaken me, uh, verse 13. Uh, you've served other gods. Therefore, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. You haven't truly turned away from those things. Cry out to those gods for your deliverance and let them deliver you. Look at verse 15. The children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So their hearts are, are calling out to the Lord. They, they've acknowledged that they turned from God. Now here again, after he says, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to help you any longer. I'm not going to deliver you. Then they said in verse 16, So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. You can see the heart of, of God, the father heart of God, that, that he, he's giving tough love to his kids here. They're rejecting him. They have been going after their own ways for such a, a long period of time. And, but God knows that, that they really need to come to the end of themselves, to the, to the bottom of the barrel, if you will. No more resource, no more strength so that they will recognize that they don't have any strength and the gods to which they have turned, they don't have any strength to offer them either. He said, I'm not gonna answer you any longer, meaning as long as their hearts are just bent on pursuing after these things, that having him and them, that uh, he's not content with that. And he's not content to, allow them to be content with that. He's going to allow them to get to a place of complete and utter discontent with their sinful pursuits. So they came to the place with God revealing to them their heart. And finally, instead of just acknowledging their sin, they acknowledge their sin and they repent by putting away their gods or formerly their gods. They put away the foreign gods from among them in verse 16. Now, uh, come down to verse 18. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin the fight against the people of Ammon? He shall be the head over all the inhabitants 
of Gilead. So they know that God has given himself to raise up deliverers, judges, from among the people of Israel throughout their history since Joshua has died. They're wondering who is the one that's going to begin to fight. Who is God going to raise up amongst us? There's no volunteers. And there's no one sensing the call of God to be upon their lives just at this point in time. Uh, then we see, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. This was somebody that God had been working in his life. Uh, he's a mighty man of valor. Remember where we had seen that before. We see it in regards to Gideon in, Je in Judges chapter 6. Peace be to you, mighty man of valor, the angel of the Lord says to Gideon. And here we see Jephthah being referred to as a mighty man of valor. The problem is that he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead begot Jephthah. The problem with this is not so much for Jephthah, because he couldn't control his parentage. He couldn't control who his mom and dad uh, were. He didn't, couldn't control their character or the circumstance of his conception and his birth. But people around him disqualified him on the merits of what they knew about his birth, about his conception. Look at verse 2. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. They don't want him around because they have no intention of sharing with him what is going to be left for them in their father's will. They consider him to be an outcast and illegitimate, that he really didn't have any rights or privileges in their family. They, didn't have, uh, he, he, they weren't going to us, allow him any family connection. So they, they kick him out of the house, they kick him out of the family, and Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And worthless men band together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. All right, so we're looking for pictures of Jesus. Remember, Jesus has said to his disciples the, the day that he is raised, resurrected from the dead, when he's talking to the two men on the road to Emmaus, he said that all Moses and the prophets have spoken about me. Uh, he speaks to all of his disciples later that evening, and then for the next 40 days, as we continue looking at, uh, continue to read in Levit or excuse me, in Luke chapter 24, after Jesus appears to all of the disciples, with the exception of Thomas on resurrection evening, and he begins to open up to them the scriptures and how they must be fulfilled and how he has been fulfilling them. And that it's those scriptures that speak of him. Even in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he says the same thing. He says, these are those scriptures that speak of me. Where do we see Jesus here in the story of Jephthah? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, let's look at Jephth Jephthah's name. Uh, his name, Yiphthak, is what it is in, in uh, Hebrew, and it means he will open. A picture there of Jesus, that he's going to open up the way of salvation for us, just by the very virtue of his name. He will open. And they, the, the place where all of this is occurring is Gilead. Gilead means a, a heap of testimony. Uh, do you remember when we looked at uh, this, the story of Joshua coming across to Jericho and the first place that they settle or, or uh, set up camp when they cross the Jordan River and they are circumcised, it's in a place called Gilgal. Uh, here again we have Gal or Gilead, gal -yad. Uh, The Gal is that place meaning uh, testimony. So, He's going to heap up a testimony. 
the one, this Jephthah, the one who will open up a testimony for those whom he is going to deliver. Furthermore, have a look here in verse 1. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute. He was, as far as morality is concerned, he was illegitimately conceived. He was considered to be a less than everybody else, a low life. That he couldn't uh, attain to the, the heights or the standards of other people in society simply because of his parentage. Be encouraged tonight that your parentage, your upbringing, does not disqualify you in the family of God. It doesn't disqualify you in the, in the things of God. At the cross of Jesus Christ, the, the, the ground is level. Everybody is on level ground, equal footing. There's nobody higher or lower than another. We are all equals in the family of God at the foot of the cross through Jesus Christ. But let's look here at Jephthah. How, how does his life picture Jesus? There's some parallels here. There's some similarities. Well, they, the brothers of Jephthah disowned him. Didn't esteem him as being part of the family. Go, come with me to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we have at the very beginning uh, verses... The woman who is caught in adultery. It, it sets a stage for us here in the remaining part of what chapter 8 deals with. We're not going to take a lot of time to explore it, but I want us to be aware of it. Jesus is speaking to this woman who's caught in adultery, and because she's a sinner, people, these religious leaders, take her and are looking down upon her wanting to condemn her, each one holding a stone in their hands, ready to stone her, ready to kill her, if Jesus gives the word. The whole idea, the whole intention is to trap Jesus in his words. But we're all sinners. None of us are without sin. And that's why Jesus says, the one without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. And Jesus will not condemn those who, by faith, that he puts and ignites in our hearts, to come to him and believe and trust in him for salvation. Well, I want us to look here at verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. The reason that they asked him, where is your father? Depending upon your translation, father may be capitalized here to indicate God the Father, but they're not asking it in that sense. The translators, the ones that are, are um, writing this or printing this for us, some of them have chosen to capitalize when it's referring to God the Father. In the Greek, there's no capitalization, and they weren't referring to God the Father in this instance. Although we know that Jesus' Father certainly is God Almighty. Well, what did they have in mind when they were saying, Where is your Father? They thought they knew about Jesus. Look down in verse 39. <clears throat> Excuse me, 39. They answered and said to Jesus, Abraham is our Father. And Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Now, pay attention here in verse 41. Look what they say about his parentage. You do the deeds, so Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we were not born of, look what he, they said, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Then I want us to look down in one more verse, in verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to Jesus one more time, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Why do they call him a Samaritan? The Samaritans were those that resulted when the, uh, the Assyrians came and invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. 
And then they populated that northern region, the capital of, was Samaria, and they intermarried with the Israelites, and then their offspring became known as Samaritans. The Gentiles were intermarrying with the Jews, and the Jews in the southern kingdom were, regarded them as half-breeds, as less than, even to the point that in the time of Christ, uh, that some 700 years later, after the Samaritans, after, after the, uh, uh, the Assyrians came in and intermarried with the, with the people of Israel, now even 700 years later, at the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were still looked down upon as rejects. So that's why they refer to Jesus as a Samaritan, that he's rejected, that he's a half-breed. We were not conceived of, back in verse 41, we were not conceived or born of fornication. That was their consideration. That's, that's what they believed Jesus to be. Now, Mary wasn't a prostitute, but they believed that it was the result of uh, extramarital or even before uh, marriage took place. Jesus was discredited among his brothers, so to speak, just as Jephthah was. And they kicked him out. They, they sent him away. They, they were saying, we, our father is Abraham. We want nothing to do with you. This is where Jephthah is. Well, come back to Judges chapter 11. Jephthah ends up leaving. He fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. The land of Tob is located on the east side of Gilead. So this is a modern map today of Israel. You notice it in Jerusalem is one of the bigger letters there, the bigger words. Uh, Ammon is located there. That would be the uh, Ammon is what it's called. Uh, that would be the region of ancient Ammon. Between the body of water where Jerusalem is located, the Dead Sea, and directly north of that is the Sea of Galilee. Connecting the two is, this, is the Jordan River. We had seen that in the last map. Tove is, or Tobe as you see it here, is just outside of the region of uh, Gilead, out of the region of Israel. This is where they would go. It was referred to as the good land or the, the land of Tov. Pronounced it as Tov. Uh, literally, in the Hebrew, that's what it is, Tov. Not Tob, but Tov. In the English, that's, that's the uh, translation. Uh, Tob. In Hebrew, when you want to say good morning, you would say Boker Tov. Uh, morning is Boker, or Boker. Uh, tov is good. And so he goes to the land of Tov, good land. He went, it doesn't just say that he went to Tov, but he went to the land of Tov. Ba'aretz Tov it means went to the good land. He went to a place um, where when his brothers sent him away and disqualified him, it's like what, similarly with Jesus, when they sent him away from them. In other words, they didn't literally send him away, but they wanted, him not, wanted nothing to do with him. So in their minds, they're sending him away. And he goes about in places that they would have disregarded. And he gathered to himself what many of the Jews in John's gospel and particularly, and in the gospels uh, generally speaking, when it speaks of the Jews, uh, it is referring to the Jewish leaders, the ones who had turned away from God. And so by and large, the Jews, the Pharisees, the, the ruling class, the, the Levites, the, the priests, they would have regarded the people where Jesus was ministering in Galilee as 
as second-class citizens. In the book of Acts, we read about Peter and John, and when they had been arrested, the Sanhedrin looked at them and said, notice that they were unlearned men. <laughs> In other words, they didn't have any status, they didn't have any pedigree, they, they didn't have anything about them that would give them any credibility, except they took note. Although they were unlearned men, they had been with Jesus. These were the men that Jesus brings around him. Jesus himself was a man, a mighty man of valor. And he leaves his brothers, as it were, and he goes to a land that others would have rejected, and he considered to be a good land, a, a land where he was going to harvest those that would follow after him. In Judges chapter 11, it says that he, he gathers around him a worthless band of men. That's what the people that follow Jesus were regarded as, worthless men. Uh, they were un, uh, unschooled, unlearned. They're just a bunch of fishermen, a bunch of, of backwoods, backwaters hicks. But Jesus gathers them around him, and it says with Jephthah, he gathers them, and they went out raiding with him. And everywhere Jesus went, he was raiding the camps of the enemy. When he sent out his disciples in twos, 72 of them, that everywhere they went, they were healing the sick, they were raising the dead, they were casting out demons. And when they came back to Jesus, giving him a report, they said, even the demons are subject to us. So they went out raiding, if you will, these, as they were considered by others, worthless bands of men. But Jesus raises those that don't have really any status of themselves. Our only status and recognition is because of Jesus Christ himself. Remember what Jesus said when they came back to him and said, even the demons are subject to us. He said, don't rejoice that the demons uh, are obedient to the authority that I've given you. I saw Satan cast out of heaven. Rejoice rather that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he even rescued them. He raided the kingdom of darkness and, re and, and rescued them to himself. Gave them purpose, gave them life, gave them meaning. So he's rejected by his own, even as in John chapter 1, it says, He came to his own, verse 11, and his own did not receive him. This was, before Jesus was received by the Jews, he was received by this worthless band of men, these Gentiles in many respects. I don't mean the disciples were, were Gentiles, but there were many Gentiles that came to him, even as he went to the region of the Gadarenes and, and uh, the, the woman from Tyre. These ones where Jesus says that uh, the, the bread does not belong to the dogs, and she said, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs. Paul tells us that not many of us had anything really of any credibility or, or worth. None of us were noble. None of us were with great strength. But our boasting now, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. We were weak. We weren't wise. We weren't noble. But Jesus took all of those things to shame the wise, to, uh, to shame the strong, to put them... Uh, in a place of, of gaping mouths, as it were. Look what God does in, in the life of somebody who, who puts that life in the hands of God Almighty. And nobody can glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. Who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, or he who boasts, let him boast and glory in the Lord. Well, he's been cast off. 
the Ammonites have been raiding Gilead. They have been coming against them. They'd even crossed the Jordan River and heading into the heart of Israel to, Beth, uh, to Benjamin and to Ephraim. And he, they are wreaking havoc throughout all the region of Israel now, not just in Gilead on the eastern part of Israel. So, um, the people of Ammon, they made war, verse 5, Judges chapter 11. And the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tov. They said to Jephthah, come and be our commander, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. It's interesting how uh, when people don't really suit our needs at the moment, we can tend to dismiss them particularly if they don't measure up in many of our expectations, like Jephthah did. But when push comes to shove, it's, see, it's shown that uh, God is with us. You know what it's like when you have shared the gospel with others and you've been rejected by family or friends or coworkers, but when, when they are down and out, when they've come to the very bottom, they're reminded of the testimony where God has taken you and raised up your Gilead, your Gilead, where it's a heap of a testimony. You've heaped up a testimony, one testimony on top of another, and they have realized that God has come to your victory over and over again. When they're down and out, more often than not, they'll remember your words and they'll come to you and say, hey, you tell me about that testimony or that time that you said God came through for you, I need him. Keep your trust in Jesus that he will bring these people to himself eventually. And so it was the people of Ammon made war. The, the elders of Gilead came to Jephthah and says, come, help us out. Be our commander, look at verse 6. Come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of Ammon. He's saying, be our general. Jephthah said, didn't you hate me? Didn't you expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Jephthah's not rubbing their noses in it. He's just saying, why now? He's allowing them to recognize their utter need and dependence of what he has to offer through the strength of God. Really, this is what it's like when you see this is the people of Israel. They are going to come to their Messiah one day. When, as they've rejected him, when finally the blinders have come off and they recognize that he alone is the one that they will come to him and say, yes, we hated you, we expelled you. We figured there was, there was nothing uh, that I wanted to have to do with you. I want you more than my commander, though. Look what Jephthah says. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, verse 8, that is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our, look, first of all, they said, be our commander, back in verse 6, come and be our commander. And now in verse 8, they're saying that uh, be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So more than just a general, more than just one leading the charge and the victory, but more than that, we want you to be our head, head over all of us. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according to your words. And so he came back and went with the elders, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all these words before the Lord in Mizpah. And we've already looked at where that's located on the map, that region uh, in Israel, in the eastern side of the Jordan River. 
This is another picture of Jesus where he's not just to be received or looked at as our commander, but he needs to be received as head over us. That's why Ephesians chapter 1 says that, that God has exalted him. God has raised him from the dead. The, the power of the Holy Spirit worked in him, raising him from the dead, seated, seating him at the right hand of the Father, and making him head over all things, even the church. Those who would follow him, follow him not just as our commander, not one who just comes in every so often to rescue us in our time of need, but the one who is head over our lives in every respect. It's amazing how uh, the picture of Jesus is throughout the scriptures, page after page, scripture after scripture, verse after verse. Will I really be your head? And he says, yes, you will be your, our head. May the Lord be our witness if we don't do according to your words. This Mizpah is probably the same place, is the same place that uh, Laban and Jacob had met several hundred years earlier, their ancestor. And they had made an agreement. They set up pillars at that point in time, stones, say, let, saying, may the Lord watch between you and me while we're absent from one another. May the Lord keep a testimony between us. And this is what they're doing yet again at this point in time. May the Lord be our witness. Well, we see that Jephthah is, is working here and God is raising him up. He, he comes to the king of Ammon. Look at, look at the message that he sends. Verse 12. He sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, What do you have against me? Why have you come to fight against me in my land? See, Ammon did not live in the land of Canaan. They lived outside of the land of Canaan. And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, said, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from the Arnon, this were in verse 13, as far as the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands peaceably. In other words, hand those lands back to me and nobody gets hurt. Well, Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, and, and this is what he said. Israel didn't take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers. Notice what Jephthah is doing. He's, he's bringing the correct history, the truth of what happened in their respective past, in their respective histories, especially when they intersected one another. So we, we were going to go around. We came to the east side of the land of Moab partway, we're halfway through verse 18, and encamped on the other side of the Arnon, but they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land into our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, so Sihon gathered all his people together and camped in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all of his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. And now the Lord God of Israel is dispossessed. That's the word Yaresh that we saw last week. Dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Why should you then, Yareshit, will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? 
So whatever the Lord our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. And now are you better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in the Heshbon and its villages, in Orior and its villages and all the cities along the banks of Arnon, how many years? For 300 years. Why didn't you recover them within that time? What he's saying is, God gave us this land. We were going through peacefully. We asked permission to go through your land. It was denied, so we were intending to go around. But you launched an attack. God handed you over into our hands, and we defeated you, and we took your territory. That's the, the rule of war. When, when your God... Now, he's not acknowledging that they, their gods are truly gods, but in their estimation that when they go into battle in the name of their God and conquer lands and territories, they don't give them back to those that they conquered. He said the same thing is true for us. We had no intention of taking your land, but because you launched an attack, God gave us victory, and consequently, we now occupy this land. We are not giving it back. God has given it to us, and we have taken possession. We have yareshed it. We've been here for 300 years. Why didn't you do something about it in these last 300 years? Of the Shin. The Shin is the letter of the Hebrew alphabet that uh, represents the number 300. And if you recall from our study with Gideon, that that number was significant with the number of people that he was left with in his army, 300 fighting men. We also saw that this letter Shin is the letter that represents the name of God, Shaddai, Almighty. It's represented by this one particular letter. So when Jephthah speaks about it's been this way for 300 years, he's not just speaking about 300 years, but there's this picture that God is bringing to bear here where his very name is imprinted upon the land. You can even see that in the city of Jerusalem uh, where there are three valleys that go uh, on either side of, of the city of Jerusalem, and then one through the middle, forming from a topographical view, if you were in an airplane not too high up, you'd be able to see the topography of the city of Jerusalem forming this particular letter, the letter Shin. So there's significance when Jephthah is bringing this uh, information the history, he's saying, our God has led us to Yaresh, this land. His name is imprinted upon it. We are not letting it go. It's like he's saying, God has given this land to us. His name is imprinted upon it. We're not giving it back. Verse 27, I've not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. And again, another picture of, of Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge you. My father will judge. Jesus gave his life as a as a sacrifice, as a ransom to save. But there is a time that he's going to judge that God, on the basis of an indestructible life, on the basis of his righteousness, that he didn't come to judge the first time, but he came to bring salvation. But those who reject that salvation that is offered to, to them will be judged by virtue of his resurrection. Paul speaks about this in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, I believe it is. Uh, actually, let's just go there for a, for a quick second. Let's just give our attention to that passage. Verse 31, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. 
speaking about Jesus, he has given proof or assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so Jephthah was giving them ample opportunity. Turn back and you'll be fine. You stay here, I'm going to judge you. God will bring judgment against you. May the Lord the judge render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. They sealed their fate. God was going to judge them. Well, in verse 29, we see that the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, comes upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he had advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return to peace from the people of Ammon, surely uh, it shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Aror as far as Mineth, 20 cities, and to Abel, Kariamim, with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. So we see the people of Ammon, they are to the east of Gilead, and Jephthah launches the attack from Mizpah. He, he goes, we see that they've, the Ammonites have been in Ephraim, they've been in Benjamin, so you see the Ephraimites there, and then the uh, area of attack that goes southward to rout the enemy, the Ammonites. So he makes a vow. What do you think of that vow? Back in verse 29, uh, verse, uh, verse 30. He makes a vow. If you indeed will deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then when I get home, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from this battle, then surely it will be the Lord's. I will offer it up as a burnt offering. People, a lot of scholars, they, they are on two sides of, of this. Some say, yes, he, they, he did offer whatever came out of his house as a burnt offering. And uh, if you are familiar with the story, we discover, okay, spoiler alert, here it comes. His daughter is the first one to come out, and that's who he offers up. They say that he offered her as a burnt offering, a sacrifice. Others say, no, it's not possible that that would be the case. Well, let's look at a couple of things here so that we can gain an understanding and appreciate that truly Jephthah is not making a rash vow here, and he does not sacrifice his daughter. He doesn't offer up a human sacrifice. I want to show it to you. And again, this is a picture of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah. Uh, again, we get the same picture of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord, or excuse me, in chapter 3 of both, of both uh, Gospels, where the, uh, at his baptism, the Father speaks and says, this is my son whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. And the, the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove. And then we read that uh, in Matthew chapter 4, he's led into the wilderness. In John, Luke chapter 4, he's led into the wilderness by the Spirit. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And Jephthah makes a vow. And God gives him the victory with full awareness of the vow that he has made. Now, God knows that what is going to come out of Jephthah's house is his daughter and not an animal. If it's an animal, it's not a big deal because that's permitted. But if it's a human, then God will not endorse that. He will not permit it. God knows full well that this is what's going to happen that Jephthah, if the victory is there, that Jephthah is going to offer the first thing that comes out of his house. God will not condone or endorse 
such actions, such activity. Uh, one, that's one good point to show us that it was not a, a sacrifice that he brought her to. Um, in excuse me, Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 2, it speaks about the offerings that the people would bring. The word there in the Hebrew is korban, korban. Um, Jesus speaks about this gift of korban in Mark chapter 7. We're not going to take time to get into it in a deep way, but just to be aware that, that there would be things that people would offer or dedicate, consecrate to God, calling it Corbin. So I would encourage you to read through Mark chapter 7, verses, verses 5 through 13. Um, the, the Pharisees are all concerned about traditions of the elders, that the disciples aren't keeping the traditions of the elders. But Jesus, excuse me, is not concerned about the traditions of the elders. He's concerned about the condition of our hearts. And he says that Isaiah spoke about you hypocrites when he said that uh, you're, you honor me with your lips and with your mouths, um, you, you worship me, but your heart is far from me. You, you're teaching doctrines of men as, uh, as commandments. And you lay aside the commandment of God and you hold the tradition of men. You reject the commandments of God so that you may keep your traditions. Moses said in verse 10 of Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 7, um, Honor your father and mother. The one who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to a father, his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin. That is a gift to God, meaning that it's consecrated or it's dedicated, meaning that they're no longer obligated to the command of God. Well, Jephthah isn't doing something where he's no longer commanded are no longer obligated to the command of God. What he's, Jesus isn't minimizing Corbin, things that are dedicated or consecrated, but he's saying don't give those things dedicated to God over and above the command of God. Jephthah is dedicating whatever comes out of his house in keeping with the command of God. In Leviticus chapter 5, verses 4 and 6, 4 to 6, if somebody makes a, an oath, vows a vow, and uh, realizing that it was rash, then there is provision in the law for them to redeem the vow, as it were. If something was declared Corbin, an offering to God, it could no longer be used for its original purpose. That's what is going on here. Well, the victory is secured. When Jephthah came back to his house in Judges 11, verse 34, when he comes back to Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. It came to pass, when he saw her, that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You're among those who trouble me, for I've given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said, My father, if you've given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, so that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. So he said, Go and... He, went, he sent her away for two months. So he had ample time to be reminded of the command of God. He knew their history. He knew the, the word of God. We already saw that earlier in the chapter when he's speaking to the king of the people of Ammon. Go, and he sent her away for two months. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to, now in some translations it says, to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. But really the word lament there, it's not used in that way any other place in Scripture. The other place that it's used, it's referred to, uh, to rehearse or to commemorate something. We see it back in the uh, song of, of Deborah in Judges chapter 5. 
chapter 5 and verse 11, that the people who are, uh, the, who are singers, they are reciting the righteous acts of God. They are rehearsing or commemorating the same word that is being used here. Not lamenting, but commemorating. They're lifting up this fact that, that this young lady, she was willing to go along with the decree of her father to live her life as celibate, not being married and not having any children, to the devotion, to the dedication of God Almighty. See, there's no condemnation of the vow. When we might say, well, the other judges, they weren't all uh, righteous either. Samson, when he is, is deceived by Delilah and gives in to the lust of the eyes and, and the flesh, uh, with Gideon as well. But when we see those instances, then this, the text speaks against it. Uh, with Samson, his eyes, he was conquered and his eyes were put out and he was put in, uh, he was subdued and, and put as a prisoner. With Gideon, in Judges chapter 8, we read that he had taken the gold that was the result of the victory, and he made a golden ephod, but the people prostituted themselves against that. And, and it, it was to their destruction or devastation. It brought the people low. It's in um, uh, Judges chapter 8, and I think it's verse 27. See if I can bring it. Uh, 27, yes. Uh, all Israel played the harlot with them, and it became a snare to Gideon and his house. So the scripture speaks against those things that are, are sinful, that God does not approve of. Nothing is spoken against this, yet God is supremely opposed to human sacrifice. Look what it says here. It says that she mourned her virginity, not her death. She went about for two months mourning her virginity, mourning the fact that she would never be with a man in marriage. She would never have children. That's what she is mourning. Look here again. It's, it's a picture of Jesus, his only child. We can't help but picture here Abraham and Isaac, an only child. Jesus being the one and only of the Father. I want to show you an ancient Israelite house. And so this is what they would have looked like, similar to this. This is a, a house that was a little more prosperous than your average. Nevertheless, the, this is the layout of the average household, uh, although most that are less prosperous than this one would have, have, would have had fewer stalls for the animals that would have been there. The, so the area for the animals would have been fewer. So it wasn't abnormal for somebody to expect that one of their animals would come out of the house because that's where they lodged through the night and they were let out sometime early to mid-morning. So Jephthah anticipating as he comes back that this is what he could reasonably expect to greet or meet him. One other thing is this helps give some understanding regarding Luke chapter 2 when it says regarding Mary and Joseph. Mary gave birth to her firstborn and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the and many translations say the inn, but the word there in the Greek literally is guest chamber. And so that would have been the area upstairs, and there was no room for them in the guest chamber, but they had room in the lower area where the animals would have been. They would have been put out for the night to accommodate Mary, Joseph, and her newborn child, and that's why she placed him in a manger. In further in Luke chapter 10, we see one other use of the word in the English of an inn. It's where the Good Samaritan goes and rescues the man that was left for dead on the Jericho Road. He takes him to an inn. And in that case, it literally means a lodging place, a place that you pay money for people to stay over, an inn. Uh, whatever comes out of my house shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Um, that word and could also be translated as or. 
meaning shall surely be the Lord's, or I will offer it up as a burnt offering. It's, it's a figure of speech, in a sense, where it's being used to refer to those things that are used as an offering to God. When it speaks of a, of a burnt offering, it speaks about that which is holy, W-H-O-L-E-Y, or entirely given to the Lord. In Exodus chapter 38, uh, verse 8, and 1 Samuel chapter 1, and uh, excuse me, chapter 2, and verse 22, it speaks about the women that dedicated themselves or served at the temple. Uh, excuse me, at the tabernacle. The temple is not yet built in either of those uh, two points in Israel's history. Exodus chapter 38 and 1 Samuel chapter 2. It's not unlike what Hannah did in 1 Samuel chapter 1, where she, in verse 11, vows a vow, saying, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. In other words, I will declare him Corbin. I will dedicate him. I will consecrate him to you. And she did. We read about it in verse 22 that um, after he's weaned, then she returns to Shiloh. And that's where Samuel is given to the care of Eli the high priest. And he will live out his days there as one who is dedicated to the Lord. This is what Jephthah ends up doing. And it's not unlike Jesus who has made a vow that he, he is going to take those whom God has given us in the victory against sin, uh, the enemy of our souls, Satan, that he's going to consecrate us. He's going to set us apart and dedicate us unto God. See, Jephthah is doing this by the, the prompting of the Spirit of God to, to be a a type, as it were, of Jesus Christ, who is the deliverer, the one who, uh, who opens up for us a testimony, to heap one testimony upon another. And that he will, uh, he offers us up as, as it were, a burnt sacrifice. Burnt sacrifice literally means a whole or an entire sacrifice. And it's not uncommon in Exodus chapter 29, Leviticus chapter 8, that uh, we see the reference to Aaron and Moses and Aaron's sons who are given sacrifices in their hands and they wave them to the Lord and those sacrifices are then to be burnt up in place of Aaron, his sons, and Moses. The wave offering was an offering that was representing them and then burnt up entirely, meaning that they were consecrated, devoted to God. That's what I believe with all of my heart that is going on here with Jephthah and his daughter. One last thing that I want us to look at in Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. Excuse me for a moment while I get there. This is what the Lord says. Keep justice, do righteousness. For my salvation is about to come and my righteousness is to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Don't let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. Jephthah's daughter was not a eunuch in that sense, but she was just as poorly off as far as man is concerned, that she was like a dry tree. She was never going to have any offspring. Those who keep my Sabbaths, choose what pleases me, and hold tightly to my, uh, to my covenant... Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting, excuse me, everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This is that picture 
that we see here with Jephthah and his daughter. He, he gives her to the dedication of the Lord, of serving him at the tabernacle in Shiloh that we had looked at, that location uh, in central Israel. And she allows, she, ag she agrees to it. For him, it becomes a great, a great cost, a great price. You have brought me low, oh my daughter. No doubt he was hoping that it would have been an animal that would have come out. Yet he's still willing to go through with it and offer her up to dedicate her wholly. And praise God that Jesus has done the same thing in offering us up holy. And we see in this uh, picture, Gideon forsakes his family. Jephthah offers up his only child. Samson dies for God's people to experience salvation. We see type after type of Jesus being presented to us throughout the pages. And Jephthah had to do all of this by faith. By faith. By faith, he destroyed the armies of the enemies, subdued nations, by faith, he offered up his daughter to God. By faith, he walked in obedience to the Lord. By faith, he made this vow. Praise God that Jesus has done the same thing. So, here am I and the sons you have given me, the daughters you have given me. Jesus has done so much. He's gone so far for us. Hebrews chapter 2. I want to... I want to read that. That's where we'll finish. It's fitting for him for whom all things, this is 2 verse 10, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will declare your name. To my brothers, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Setting us up before him. We have, he has released us from our fear of death, which we were all our lifetime subject to its bondage. In verse 16, indeed, he does not give help to, his, to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to help those who themselves are tempted. Praise God. Here am I. And the children God has given me. The vow that Jesus has made. I'm going to lift them up, consecrate them before you, my God. By faith. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. That he is the one who, will, who started this work in us. He's, going to, he's faithful to bring it to completion. Until the day that he shows himself in glory. God, I pray that you would help us that our eyes would be on you so that our shortcomings, our failures, our sins, would, we, we would not allow them to, to derail us or disqualify us. That we would look to you seeing that you, you sanctify us, you make us holy, you set us apart and consecrate us to the, to the work to which you've called us. This is a work that you've done in us, for us, by grace through faith. Help us, Lord, so our eyes are on you, so that the salvation we've received by grace, we continue to walk in, to do your works by that same grace. And help us to trust you, Lord, not to look to the left or to the right, that we would be rescued out of every temptation. And you give us the victory, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the vow you had taken upon yourself to destroy the enemy and to make us holy, to bring us into your family. You've purchased us for God with your blood. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. We look to you with eyes of faith. Amen.
praise the Lord. God bless you, church. Good to spend this evening with you, this study, looking at the life of Jephthah. And we look forward next week as we look at the life of David. We might be there for a couple of weeks. There's a ton of stuff to look at. I'll have to pare it down. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be there for months. Uh, anyway, God bless you. May the Lord um, bless you throughout these next days. And we look forward to spending worship with you on Sunday and again here next Tuesday night. In Jesus' name, amen.